Ah, oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, presented by AT&T 5G. Just Andrew Wiebe in this episode, a short one for you during this World Cup. The U.S. on Saturday morning, it is going to be church a day early, but in the soccer variety. I cannot wait. we got to watch along with some real legends. Bruce Arena should be rolling through Charlie Davies. We're going to Paul Moduka, maybe myself, Susanna Collins, TBD. Head over to YouTube to join in that watch along for the U.S. Netherlands game. Should be really fun. On this day on the podcast feed, we've got Garth Lagerway. He's the new CEO and president of Atlanta United. We always enjoy talking to Garth. He's able to address specific issues to whatever club that he's working at, as well as big picture macro issues within MLS. Really interesting conversation about his relationship with Carlos Bocanegra, Gonzalo Pineda. What's going to happen with Joseph Martinez? Will Tiago Almada be sold? He just played for Argentina today on this Wednesday as I record this introduction. I think you'll enjoy this interview with Garth, even if you're not an Atlanta United fan. With that, we'll send it over to Atlanta. Here's Garth Lagerway. Oh, it's an AT&T 5G call to the field to Atlanta to a guy that we're not accustomed to being in Atlanta. But here he is, the biggest news of the MLS offseason, Garth Lagerway, the CEO Big three-letter title there, Garth, and president of Atlanta United. Congratulations, man. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I, I, you know, feel like I, I worked 15 years for an opportunity to, to run a club and to have uh, the ability to oversee both the business and soccer sides. It's, a, it's an honor. It's a privilege. Um, and I can't wait to get to work for the 17s here in Atlanta and hopefully uh, restore them to the prominence that they're used to enjoying. So when you become a CEO and president, apparently they give you two desks – if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that. It's a double desk situation. You need it. You, you said it. You've been working toward this for 15 years. This is what you want. It is the title, but more importantly, I think the responsibly, uh, responsibility excuse me, and level of leadership. Uh, what is the job in your mind? Tell people what your job is. My job is to try to make everybody better. Um, and so it's, you know, I think the biggest change from being a GM to being a CEO is just in the GM, you know, based on the resources of the organization, you are given a budget, you're told, Hey, do the best you can, you know, try to be the most efficient you can within these parameters. And as a CEO, you're able to say, Hey, what do we do to generate revenue? What do we do to maximize revenue? And now where should those resources be allocated across the entire enterprise? Um, and it allows you, I think, to strategically plan over a period of years, uh, in a little bit more efficient manner. Um, and to be clear, like Seattle, you could do this. It's just, you know, Adrian Hanna was the, is the most soccer knowledgeable owner in the league, right? And, and so you could make the, the real easy argument that, you know, the skill set just wasn't needed in Seattle. And so, uh, you know, again, there's, there's, none of this is, is like, hey, one's better than the other. Just, um, you know, very happy to be here in Atlanta where uh, you have the, the broad purview and opportunity and now the responsibility to try to, uh, make everything as efficient as possible and, and to vertically integrate as best we can across all the platforms. And um, then again, hopefully start winning some championships again. Well, efficiency, vertically integrating. Well, we are, we got the lingo going right We're now. We're going back in time, right, Andrew? Yeah. I, mean, I knew you'd recognize those words. Here we go. Let's talk, uh, let's talk process before we get into nitty gritty. So when did the discussion start on this? Like, what's the timeline here? Did they reach out to you? You reach out to them? What mattered to you? What mattered to them? How did this process go? Yeah, look, the process started after the season. So, I mean, understandably, you know, they're trying to, Atlanta's trying to make the playoffs, Seattle's trying to make the playoffs. So, it was really not possible to do anything before then. Uh, you know, unfortunately for both sides, both teams miss. Um, so, the process begins at that point and, you know, a couple different interviews along the way. And then it kind of culminates in this uh, somewhat bizarre and in, in retrospect sequence where, uh, you know, we're, we're in the middle of the interview process and, and no decision's been made. And the you know the fan vote is announced in Seattle and and you know I, I get retained, um, but you know I have no you know I, I have no knowledge of what may or may not happen as a result of on, on the other side. So um, you know definitely you know was up there and given a twenty minute speech about how great it was to be the Sounders and it was completely sincere. And and at that moment that was that was what I knew. You know I was gonna I was going back to the Sounders. There was no other conversation. There was no other. Uh, opportunity or agenda or anything like that that was uh, from the heart and it was a reflection of eight years of you know a lot of work and some success and um, certainly a, a close affinity to the Seattle fan base that had developed over that time and now hopefully uh, that can translate here in, in Atlanta to the, to the 17s. Alright so let me ask you this because I, I think about this in my own life and I'm sure you've thought a lot about this and, and had mentors over the years but you're stepping into this new role do you have a mentor? Do you have someone you've gone to to sort of prepare for this? Like, what makes a good CEO in your mind? 
Uh, I've had, look, I've had a ton of really good mentors along the way. Um, I think one of the strengths of my career is I've done a bunch of different things. So, um, you know, whether it was Barton Clark, uh, who was the law firm partner that I learned a lot from at Latham, um, whether it was Dave Chapkitz, who gave me my first gig at, at Salt Lake, um, and look, Adrian Hanauer at, at, at Seattle Sounders, right, you know, who had been a general manager himself, uh, you know, for a number of years before I came in and took over. So I think you can learn a lot from a lot of different people along the way about a lot of different things. And, um, you know, I don't know that I have one specific CEO mentor um, other than maybe my dad who said, hey, always keep learning. You know, that that's the one thing that that really he felt it stood him right in his career. And, uh, you know, uh, I turned 50 in a couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, after 15 years of doing the GM job, uh, I kind of felt like, you know, I hope this isn't all there is, you know, that, that there's nothing else left to learn. That would that be really kind of sad and tragic and unfulfilling. And, and uh, so I'm definitely excited for the next challenge. And um, you know, to do it at a great club like this. And I think with an opportunity to be part of, uh, you know, AMBSE, broadly speaking, too, is, is a really unique uh, opportunity within MLS. And I think there's a ton of potential here. And, you know, it, it really came together. I mean, like, you know, with the Seattle contract ending at the same time, you know, that, that uh, Darren Eels leaves, um, you know, for my kids, you know, I'm a father like you, Andrew, with, with young ones. And I didn't want to take them out of an environment where they would miss hosting the World Cup. You know, and so it was in Seattle was named a host city. The list of cities to which you might be willing to relocate got a lot smaller. Um, you know, but Atlanta is one of those cities as well. So um, that's really exciting. And, and uh, again, I think, uh, you know, again, we're, we're heading toward this generational opportunity in 2026. And I, I can't think of a better place to be than, than Atlanta United. It's time to learn, and you're going into the organization. I saw a quote in your press conference uh, that you'll be drinking from the fire hose, and that's pretty clear. You also said you're gonna, uh, what was it? I think it was work slow to move fast. Tell yeah, me what look, this and, this process yeah, is now. How, how do you learn? What do you, you know, what are you poking into? What are you, what are you doing now? Yeah, look, one of the things I asked in my interview is, is I said, hey, is it okay to say I don't know? Uh, because that was really it was one of the first things that Dave Chekets talked to me about. He, he, he said. When he hired me in 34, I was the youngest GM in the league at that point. And um, he said, just don't ever pretend you know what you're doing. And, you know, it was super empowering. Like, it sounds like I, I remember like literally turning pale and like freezing when he said it to me. And uh, but when I thought about it, what, you know, what he was conveying was ask questions. You know, you, 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 there is no way you know everything. You couldn't. Um, so, um, you know, is this an environment where, you know, people are going to support that and they're going to give you information and you can learn and you can ask those questions? Uh, and make that empowering, or is it, a, you know, a place where it's it's a weakness to to not know something? And so that was super important to me, uh, and and was well established in the interview process that I had a bunch of people to learn from. Um, Steve Cannon, uh, who's my new boss, and has been amazing already um, in terms of being out able to ask questions and guy who's worked for organizations all over the world. Um, you know, Rich McKay, who's running the Falcons, is one of the most prominent members of the competition committee in the NFL. I mean, these are high high level execs that have done it on all kinds of different levels. And, you know, Andrew, you and I have talked enough over the years that you, you know that I think sports is sports and, and there's synergies across sports. And, and, you know, for example, you have analytics capabilities. Um, you know, if you now have an NFL level analytics capability, maybe that's Falcon specific uh, right now, but I bet over time it's adaptable in some form or fashion where you could apply at least the concepts and the philosophies and the player development mechanisms toward uh, Atlanta United as well. And that's, that's one of the, the the synergies I'm really excited about unpacking here. How uh, will your relationship with Carlos Bocanegra work? He's had a, uh, I, I don't know if it's bumpy is the right way, but missing the playoffs is not where this club wants to be. He's taken some criticism, but you've been in his position. You know, you you <laughs> you can understand the issues that he's having. What is your relationship like with him? What will that working relationship be like? Yeah, look, and, and Carlos, Carlos and I don't know each other well. Obviously, we've, we've spent a lot of time together already. We had dinner last night. We, we spent a couple days together already. Um, but uh, he's a great guy. Everybody enjoys working with Carlos. And, um, you know, I told him from the first day, look, man, I'm not coming to do, to do your job. You know, you're, you're going to do your job. And, uh, you know, I, again, I think, Andrew, it's not controversial to say that there's a ton of talent here. Uh, there's, there are a bunch of good players. And it's now, a matter, in my opinion, it's a matter of, you know, can you mesh, mesh them together in a way that is productive, that improves the wins and losses and and look, there's some things, obviously, that, that maybe I might approach uh, slightly differently. And, and look, my, my role, again, is to try to make not just Carlos better, but uh, Gonzalo better. Obviously, we have a history together in, in Seattle as well. And, and then, uh, you know, the whole staff. You know, that's, and that's the exciting part of being a CEO is, again, not for me to get in the weeds and say, oh, we, well, we did it this way. 
Um, you know, we were joking actually. We just came out of a scouting meeting for the college draft, and you know, I traded up two spots by uh, by moving to Atlanta. Uh, but I think I've drafted uh, two players in my career that had meaningful careers on a college draft. And I think uh, Atlanta has half a dozen just since they started. So I said, whatever you do, don't listen to anything I tell you about the college draft. Um, so there's stuff like that, that it's, you know, I think there's an art to inserting yourself when it's helpful and, and staying away when it's not. And uh, overall, you know, again, trying to mesh things like how does player development work internally versus the college draft versus signing from abroad, you know, some of those more, macro things where maybe I have some wisdom that can be helpful. Uh, if a roll on falls, you take them. That's one of the that's there you go. That's one of the long that's one of the lasting lessons from the super draft. I think I think it's the Roll and Beltrans. I, I mean if you could give me like, you know, three three guys there. There you go. Uh, take them off the board. Take them off the board. Uh how well do you know Gonzalo Pineda? I mean I assume very well. What's your relationship with him like? And what did you think of his first year as a head coach? Yeah, look, what I would say is is I, I know Gonzalo, obviously we, we worked together, I think, for three years uh, in Seattle. So so no well in that sense. Um, but these are totally different roles. It's, it's not just me in a new role. It's him in a new role, right? And uh, when you're working as the assistant coach, a lot of times what you're tasked with is what the head coach assigns to you, you know, whether that's running a training session or working with a group of players or interacting with other staff. And so, um, you know, I really think it's important for Gonzalo and I uh, to, to start fresh in, in the sense of, our relationship and, and you know what I mean by that is really both of us are coming at it from a new direction and so I, I think that's it's helpful and instructive and it's been a couple of years too right I mean it's, he, he left uh, close to two years ago uh, and uh, you know I, I, I have no doubt that he's grown I've already met with him I know he's grown uh, already from where he was as a young assistant uh, and to now a young head coach and he has a lot of uh, really good ideas and, and he's working closely with Carlos and it's, you know, it's fundamentally a different dynamic, though, because I'm not in the trenches every day with the coaching staff now. You know, I'm, you know, it'll be Carlos doing that. And it'll be you know, uh, Demetrius from the cap and contract side helping out with that stuff. And again, my, my job is to make everybody uh, better and to make sure that they get the tools they need to succeed. Is that going to be hard for you? I mean, you've I been I in the weeds for a long time, sort of moving the cards around. Yeah. No, look, I mean, that's part of the challenge. And I and I, I told, I, look, I, I think I'm repeating it publicly just so everybody here can hold me accountable to it. Uh, so that if I stray from that path, you know, hopefully uh, there's a record here saying that, that, you know, that's not the intention and that's not. But no, look, Andrew, when I, when I, when I left, Seattle was a great place and it was great for my career. And, uh, you know, I have nothing but good things to say. And it was, I think, in a lot of ways would have been easier to stay there. Um, but this was a really tremendous challenge um, to go and again to grow and to learn and to take the next step in my career. Uh, and I really felt like this was something that was worth doing. And, and it was, you know, I, again, I, I didn't want that to be all there was. I wanted to to be able to see if I could impact the club holistically uh, for the long term. And um, you know, we'll we'll see how that you know the, the, yet to be determined if I'll be successful with that. But uh, I know that in order to succeed, uh, again, I need to to not micromanage and not do other people's jobs. It's, it's to pull back and to be a leader and provide a vision and, and hopefully harness all the resources here in Atlanta uh, and get them going the same direction. So I'm going to ask you some specifics here on the sporting side. And you may, given the conversation we're having, say, hey, that's a question for Carlos. It's not for me. Like I don't even want to wade in on that. But Joseph Martinez has been the heart and soul of this club for a long time, really since the start. Um, you see him on, on billboards, on murals. He has been front and center, and things broke down last year. Do you share the sentiment that seemed to be the public sentiment that the, his time with the team is over? Uh, one of the things that, that's super important, uh, Andrew, is that I honestly not have opinions on things like this. And, and, and here's what I mean. It's great to be a Monday morning quarterback from the West Coast and, and look from abroad and watch a guy in Scout and stuff. But you don't know the players. There, it's not possible that you would come in, anyone, and would say, oh, well, I know better than the guy who coached them for the last year, the guy who was the technical director here for the last year all the scouts that about like, so, um, you know, that's one thing I promised everybody here is, is I will not come in and try to impose what I believe is non-educated opinion, relatively speaking, uh, on anything that they've done to date. So, uh, again, I'm going to work with those guys. I'm going to take the determinations they made. And again, I'm going to try to advise them as how best to, to go about situation. But, but look, Joseph's had a great career here. He's been a, a huge, massive uh, player. He's had tons of success. He's part of what Atlanta United is. Um, and look, he reminds me, honestly, a little bit of Clint Dempsey in, in, uh, with Seattle Sounders, you know, where you talk about the, the impact that, that, uh, that he made, um, you know, and, you know, it, it's figuring out how exactly you're going to incorporate that into the greater club model. When do you start getting calls on Tiago Almada, if you haven't already, you and Carlos? 
It's pretty cool. He got in today, huh? Yeah. I mean, that, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's, as soon as he got in. The whole office started cheering, man. Oh, it, was, yeah. it was fun. It was, it, was, it was great to see him. Um, you know, look, uh, obviously, we'll, we'll work with Thiago as to what's best for his future and what's best for the club. But we hope he's here for a while yet. Um, I, I think it's a statement for MLS uh, that you have. You know, you've seen, I'm sure, some of the charts showing how many, what percentage of games MLS players are playing in and, you know, routinely one of the top 10 leagues in the world by that metric. And, um, you know, with the U.S. advancing and unfortunately Mexico falling just short, um, I think that would have been good from a League's Cup and a CONCACAF perspective and, uh, you know, to get somebody else advanced. I know some other people internally here might not agree with that. But, uh, <laughs> some listeners you know, as well, huh? Yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're thinking big picture, uh, but, you know, it, it, certainly we're all fans of the World Cup and with that coming again in 2026, I think that's the real opportunity is to drive the sport, uh, drive the rivalry of Mexico, uh, and I think that's a huge opportunity. So let's go big picture on the selling side. You know, we we hear all the time that MLS needs to be a better member of the world market, a better selling league, in addition to being a better buying league as well. But you, know, you need to have you need a balance in sort of the pocketbook there. From your point of view and holistically, strategically, how do you what work has to be done in advance for a player like Tiago Amada, but also in the moment to sell those players at the right fee? Like what is is there a best practices for selling players? And, and what is there if there is? Look, this is another one, Andrew, where, where my track record of selling players isn't great. Uh, you know, there, there haven't been as many opportunities to do that. We you know Seattle, we had a slightly different model. You know, we, we signed a, a Ladero, a Rui Diaz, and we said, hey, we're going to hold on to him for six or seven years. We're going to see if we can win some titles. Um, and, you know, Atlanta's, I think, tried to be all things to all people. You know, sign Miguel Alvaron, win a title, and then have the, the biggest transfer in league history. Um, you know, uh, Pity Martinez signed the best midfielder in South America, uh, and, and then sign, sell on for another huge transfer. So, um, you know, look, I, I think there can be some tweaks and some refinements and certainly that model and, and how we want to work on this going forward. I think that's an interesting area for conversations and discussions. Um, but in terms of selling, look, I'm going to come back to the same route that, that I think you know I am, which is I'm going to rely on data. And I'm going to say, what does the market tell us? And what do, what do the analytics tell us? And, you know, we are not the only team in the world selling players. Uh, you know, everyone is, and this is why, the United States playing well, and 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 again, it's not it's not just advancing, right? But the U.S. was the better team in five of six halves, and at least in my lifetime, that had never happened before. Not even in 2002. Like at no point had we played were we the better team in five of six halves, controlling matches, dictating play at times. And I think again, that's really exciting when you look at that, and and because that's the best advertisement for American players you can put out into the world, and it's it's bigger than just Atlanta United. It's it's bigger than just Tiago getting in for a couple minutes for Argentina. It's MLS and the credibility of the league uh, growing forward and continuing to grow. And that's what's going to create more economic value for everybody. So 2026 Atlanta United, what's it look like in your mind's eye? I mean, hopefully we're back in a position where we're consistently competing for championships. I mean, they, they clearly they did it. You know, they, they had us about as meteoric a rise as you possibly could in, in 17, 18, 19. Electric team that are built around electric players and I think a lot of this now is, you know, it was almost unsustainable the way the way they burst out of the gate like that. And, um, you know, so I think a little bit of a lull, a little bit of a trough so is not unexpected. Um, and now it's about stabilizing things and coming in and, and starting some processes and doing the stuff that, you know, that I think I'm good at building organizations now and uh, basing things less on one transaction and more on a, a portfolio of players and assets and uh, structures and, Again, just applying analytics as the underpinning for everything. You know, we, we, again, we all have our opinions, uh, but if we can use objective evidence uh, to inform those decisions over time, we're probably going to get more right than wrong. And, you know, that'll be the basis for what we try to build going forward. What's the evidence that you have that you've gathered that you've studied, say, about where MLS is going? Where do you think this league, not just Atlanta United, but this league is going to be? You know, I'm going to throw out 10 years because that's the end of this sort of Apple deal, this this journey will be on through the World Cup, and we hope that the World Cup is this massive boost, and then you can ride it and you can push forward. Where do you think this league can go? I, look, yes, that's a boost, but I think the, the more the most interesting time is between now and 2026 because we got this global platform for the first time in Apple, and that's that's the one other big piece here, Andrew, that you and I hadn't talked about yet. It was the ability to market ourselves all over the world. I, I genuinely believe that Atlanta United is going to start getting calls uh, from all over the place, from kids that are watching MLS games, watching Atlanta games and saying, hey, I, I want to, that's, I mean, literally, uh, Mercedes-Benz is arguably the nicest stadium in the world. 
Uh, we have one of the best training facilities in the world. Uh, you know, when we put that out there all over the world, I think you're going to have a lot of inputs uh, from all over. And that's one of the things that's really, really exciting about this Apple deal, that it really is a unique footprint now. And, you know, look, if you want to use an analogy, uh, this may be before your time, Andrew, but uh, to go back to baseball, TBS, uh, in oh, the no, 80s, that's my put time. The, put no, the Braves, I, put the I Braves. remember the 90s. My, my yep. best friend was a Braves fan because of it. Yep, there you go. And, and the Braves were all over. Now, that was national. But take the same concept, right? Now you put Atlanta United, you put them on all over the world. Um, you know, if Atlanta United is successful, um, and some of those Braves teams weren't even that successful, but uh, I, I suppose there a lot of them were, to be fair. But, um, you know, you, you see the opportunity, right? And I think if you can do that and you can raise that kind of profile, and Atlanta's a host city for the World Cup, uh, and you have – you know, one of the more rabid fan bases in the world. I mean, because again, that, that's when you look at a fan base, like, it's a great fan base, the biggest fan base in MLS, but it's one of the biggest fan bases in the world. So, you know, that stuff I think is really cool. And then you look at uh, things coming in like Leagues Cup. I, I personally, you know, you and I've talked about it. I'm really excited about what Leagues Cup can become for, for MLS and for the competition and for the rivalry. Like, I think a lot, it has a lot of formula that comes in that, that is going to really drive this thing forward between now and 2026. And now, hopefully, on the other side of the World Cup, um, you know, I think I read a paper this week that, uh, you know, the average uh, interest in soccer goes up between 20 and 40 percent after a World Cup in the host country. You know, if you build in a metric like that, again, I, I'm not a guy that believes you're going to change, have a sea change overnight and suddenly soccer is going to become the biggest sport. But again, if you if you build and you invest now in this path to 26 and you're there and you're ready in a position to capitalize on it through the Apple deal, I do think if you look out 10 years, you know, put it this way, we're going to put our best foot forward and we're going to take our best shot. And look, I think we've been distracted for too long by saying we're going to be the best league in the world by such and such. Right. And around the Iran game, Carlos Kuros authored the paper about we're going to win the World Cup by 2010. So I, I, I would like to resist uh, maybe putting a KPI on that a de- a deadline. But, yeah. Yeah. But I but I do think we're getting better. And like, look, you know, again, you look at this U.S. team. I think it's the most talented U.S. team of all time. And it's doubly interesting because they're going to be the whole core is going to be there for 2026. You know, this in a lot of ways, this team was picked to try and win the World Cup in 2026. And whether, whether they do or they don't, I do think it's going to be a period of unprecedented interest in soccer in the country. And we're going to do everything we can to try to maximize the potential of U.S. soccer and, and Atlanta United. Are MLS rosters ready to compete uh, across the league, Open Cup, Canadian Championship, CCL, Leagues Cup? I mean, are, are the rosters ready to do that at the level they need to be? I, I look, what I think that does when you play the multiple competitions is is it puts pressure to play young players, and young players are the ones that that are the ones that are going to be the future of the sport in this country. I mean, again, the U.S. team is the second or third youngest team in the World Cup, right? Clearly, we are capable of producing talent that can play at this level. Um, and I know Atlanta United's got a number of good young players that are coming through the pipeline, and it, it's one of the things that was attractive about coming here was when you look at the state of player development, um, it is in a it's in good hands, it's in a good spot, and I think we can continue to push on that front and, again, continue to make investments, and that will drive – I think that is the tide that, that raises all boats, so to speak. All right, last one for you, Garth. I know you have traffic to beat here. Messi in MLS. I hope so. Uh, you know, it would be cool. I remember I was working at, at a law firm in D.C. when, when Beckham came and, um, you know, uh, spent a lot of time buried in my cubicle and uh, a lot of people ignoring me. And then all of a sudden, uh, Beckham signed and, and uh, half the women in the firm came over and said, hey, can you get me tickets? And I was like, I, it, that, you know, it, it wasn't because they suddenly wanted to talk to me. So, uh, you know, it, it, if you can have an imp- impact like that, and I think Messi could, uh, I think that'd be really cool. Because that really was a game changer. I mean, you, you know, we think of him associating him with the DP rule and things like that. Um, but in, a, in the broader, even just uh, social sense, pop culture sense, he changed the game, and you know I think if you got Messi coming, and you know if he if he winds up in Miami, um, if he comes, uh, obviously I think we can all hope for that. I think look, will that make it tougher for Atlanta United? Uh, sure, but to have a rival like that, I think that would be amazing. All right, is it uh is this quarter zip you got is it a little bit itchy or does it feel comfortable? It's got the <laughs> Atlanta. Just checking, just trying to you know, make sure we got you in the right apparel here. It, it feels pretty good, Matt. It, it, it's a it's a new space. It's a new start. Uh, and, and as I said, time will tell. We gotta we gotta we gotta do a lot of work. Uh, but hopefully, it'll it'll all all's well that ends well. All right. Happy early fiftieth, Garth. Congratulations, CEO and President of Atlanta United. Thanks, Andrew.